Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Brandon Moore. I'm a second year student here, um, a Master of Public Policy student here at the uh, Kennedy School. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you all and um, welcome you to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum on behalf of the Institute of Politics, the Center for Public Leadership, and the Harvard Kennedy School Black Student Union. Um, tonight's screening, uh, tonight we'll be screening the powerful documentary, of course, The, the House I Live In. Um, and this movie chronicles the impact of uh, America's war on drugs the, the, the quality of the impact that, the, that America's war on drugs has had on vulnerable communities for the past 40 years. Um, tonight's screening is going to be followed by a discussion and Q&A period by two very special guests. Um, we are honored tonight to be joined by uh, Mr. Eugene Durecki, who's told me to mention everyone, to everyone that he's the uh, greatest director in the world. Um, <laughs> and we will also be joined by uh, Professor Charles Ogletree, who needs no introduction in these halls, but um, he's a professor over at uh, Harvard Law School. Um, tonight's screening is also sh serving as a kickoff event for an initiative that I, along with others, as other members of the Center for Public Leadership Student Advisory Board and the Kennedy School Black Student Union have been working on to raise awareness for issues affecting economically isolated communities here in America. Um, we are calling this initiative the Urban Leadership Laboratory. The goal of the Urban Leadership Laboratory is to simulate ideas and strategies among a diverse community of uh, future public policy leaders to improve outcomes for our people living in economically isolated communities. This program will consist of four separate sessions, each focusing on a different factor contributing to the cycle of poverty in these communities and will feature a prominent practitioner who will share their successes and early failures with the group. You will be hearing more about this initiative in uh, the next coming weeks. If you RSVP for the event, you will receive some information about the initiative. And if you haven't RSVP, please check the uh, Center for Public Leadership um, for more information on this. Um, finally, I'd like to make a few acknowledgments. Um, first, I'd like to offer a special thank you to uh, the Criminal Justice Pick for helping to organize this event. <laughs> Um, secondly, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, Harvard Undergraduate Legal Committee and the Harvard Black Law Students Association for helping to uh, promote the event. Thank you so much. And finally, I'd like to recognize my parents, David and Brenda Moore. <laughs> Thank you. They traveled up from Virginia to be here. And um, I'd also like to recognize my wife, Kiana Moore, who's been more than gracious and taking care of our two kids while I attempt to graduate and uh, organize events like this. Um, the substance of this film hits very close to home for my family, so I'm very honored that they could join tonight. Um, now I'd like to welcome to the stage Mr. Eugene Jarecki, um, who will introduce the film. And thank you all again for coming, and I hope you enjoy the event. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so we have limited time tonight, which means a couple things are in order that you need to know. The movie you're about to watch is not the full movie, and this is not just a shameless plug, it kind of is, for you to go onto iTunes and download the full movie, which is an hour and 48 minutes long. This movie tonight is about 51 minutes long, and the reason for that is to give us time to talk about it with such special people present and the ability to motivate a public discussion that's so crucial to move forward. Um, and so I do hope you get to see the longer movie, but we hope that tonight's kind of cut down movie, which is hard for us to watch, those of us who made it, because we know what got cut out, I hope it's not hard for you to watch and that it, that it gives you a lot to think about. Um, I also just want to point out that there are uh, people here tonight that I'm very honored to be in the presence of. Uh, Professor Ganeer is here. I'm incredibly happy that you're here. Uh, Professor Walt is here. And of course, the, the uh, not last but by far not least, uh, the Honorable Marion Wright Edelman is here in front of me, which I don't know that I'd ever thought I'd experience. Um, you know, these are long distance runners for justice, all three of them, and for a better and cleaner public policy that's less open to question in this country. And I take my cues in many ways from them in the pursuit that we're in. So having a discussion with them present after, after is a particular honor. And with all of you is just absolutely a vital part of what we do in getting the film out there. So Professor Ogletree and I, who I'm also always honored to be with, and I was at his class today and we did a, a piece last night in Roxbury that was greatly gratifying. Um, we'll be here to talk with you guys and do a Q&A and the rest afterwards. So please get as much as you can out of uh, the house I live in in this cut down form and I look forward to talking afterward. So thank you all very much for watching. I, I will say before we get going that uh, a couple of notes. One is that it's often very hard for me 
at the end of my movies when there's limited time to sort of force everybody to not have time to reflect. It's very hard. You watch a movie, even this cut down version, uh, there ought to be a lot to process and I, I feel badly starting things off and imposing upon that while the credits are still rolling. But I also am torn because on the other hand, I want everybody to have time and a chance to speak. There's no question that tonight we'll wrap out at a given time when it has to, but then I'll be here afterward to continue. This is a conversation I'll be continuing my whole life, so a few hours tonight won't hurt me. Uh, and will be part of that. So I'm very delighted to answer any questions you have. Um, I think Professor Ogletree is certainly on his way, um, and I'm, I'm gonna cover some time uh, without him until he gets here. Um, I certainly want to welcome Marion Wright Edelman or Professor Grenier or anybody else who's faculty. I see Professor Walt is still here. If you guys want to contribute anything, I'd love to have you do so. Um, I also, I think microphones are set up here and there for people to ask questions. I mean, I'll just tell you a little bit about, uh, maybe to give you some time to reflect on your own questions, what we hope to achieve with the movie at this point, um, and uh, what my aspirations are as a concerned person in, uh, with a movie at my disposal that I can control the fate of and I can get out there and deploy. Um, I've made several movies before and I learned over the years, it started with, a, with some lessons that were embarrassing. It started in 2006 when I had made a movie called Why We Fight and Ralph Nader uh, saw the movie and contacted me and he commended me, he said it was a really good movie. And I thought, great, wow, Ralph Nader called me, I was very impressed. And then he said, uh, so you make a good movie, he said. It was a little loaded the way he said it, but I don't notice that you deploy it very well. And my heart sank, and I kind of didn't know what he meant, and I kind of did know what he meant. And what he meant was, it's not enough for you to just go make that movie. That's not an end in itself. That's the opening salvo in a discourse or a fight or a battle or a campaign, and you have to be ready for that. Not only do you have to be ready for it, you have to proactively operate in that. And interestingly enough, movie after movie, this really struck a chord because movie after movie that I've made in the past you know, couple of decades have all had at their center a fundamental complaint and fear about the impact of capitalism on democracy. I have been of the mind, and it grows every day, that capitalism in its form that we are seeing it in the United States right now is an enemy of democracy. When you have 400 richest people in this country controlling more wealth than the bottom 150 million, I'm not sure, let me say that again, 400 people having more wealth than 150 million, I'm not sure how any founding father could have possibly felt that democracy could survive that kind of gap in power, that kind of gap in influence, when we know how much influence money can buy, when lawsuits like Citizens United are fought for the capacity to have money make influence. And so I fear for democracy, given the Kool-Aid we drank, especially during the Reagan years, that corporate that what's good for General Motors is good for America, that's what's good for corporate power is good for everyday people. So if that's the theme of recurring movies, and reasonable people can debate this, but if that's my theme, then what a hilarious farce I became when I would make a movie about that theme and then wait for some big corporate sugar daddy to come buy my movie and think, wow, I can't wait till Columbia Pictures distributes my movie and gets it out to the American people. And Ralph was aware that though I looked like a nice, well-meaning grassroots guy, I was really waiting for that field day. Because if you're a movie maker, it's quite hard work and you're really waiting for somebody to say, well done, boy, we'll take it from here. The Philistines will hear your message. And so I noticed time and again that this was not happening and that I had to get out and do what Ralph wanted, which was to deploy the film. And so since then, we have been working very hard on deployment of our films, which really means shrinking the gap between the mountain and Muhammad that all too often a movie like mine is typically just distributed, distributed to art houses in urban centers where well-meaning progressive people can purse their brow and bite their lower lip and feel very political for the evening and basically get gratified in their own pre-existing politics. And that's not nothing, that's the old preaching to the choir and I would argue choirs need preaching too because every movement needs to be self-reminded and everyone wants to keep their hopes and dreams alive. So I don't want to malign preaching to the choir, I believe very strongly in it, but it's not an end to the exclusion of preaching to the unconverted. And so how do you get a movie like this out to the unconverted? How do you get it out to inner city communities who, for example, were highly supportive of the war on drugs because they felt insecure? Inner city communities were highly supportive of the Patriot Act, despite the fact that the Patriot Act certainly is not 
good for the civil rights or civil liberties of black Americans, for example, and yet you found black folks living in inner cities who felt so insecure because of life in inner cities that anything that sounds like security immediately sounds positive. The term mandatory minimum, once they noticed, had huge support among sort of the, the uh, women living in housing projects in urban centers, like in the Bronx and, and Brooklyn and Harlem and places like that. And so that sort of went without saying, you know the mandatory minimums have support in the inner city. And so somebody for whom this didn't make a lot of sense went back to those same inner city communities and did some re-polling and some re-canvassing. And they found out that people thought that mandatory minimum meant it's mandatory that you get the minimum. <laughs> Hence the overwhelming levels of support for something that just by its phrasing seemed to answer an insecurity. And so then you find yourself often running in these wrong directions. And so welcome, Professor Ogletree. Good to see you. It's been a long time. <laughs> yeah, exactly, a few hours. So I'm just babbling on about my anger. And so la to, to wrap this up, my therapy session is almost over. Um, look, I started to try to figure out how to deploy the movie better and get it to the people to whom it most matters. So we now tour the country showing this film, for example, in churches, in prisons, in schools, in community centers, wherever I can get the film where people need to hear it who actually would constitute a social movement for the reform of this. When you speak in churches around this country and you ask for a show of hands of who has a family member behind bars or in the prison, in the, in the criminal justice system, it's the majority of hands that grow up, that go up. You ask in a black church in Chicago, every hand goes up, as happened in the last two black churches in Chicago that I spoke at and the same at Riverside Church in New York. And so this is an extraordinary possibility because there's a movement of about 30 million people in this country with a loved one in the system that I believe need to be organized to, to develop an absolutely intolerant tin ear to tough on crime rhetoric, which is really just fear mongering against your neighbor. So we're out and about sometimes doing rarefied screenings like this where all of you are in the choir so much as whatever your political views are, you're in the opinion making and policy making influence set. That's very important because this needs to be fought at that level too, but more than ever before, we're trying to fight it at the mountain comes to Muhammad level. And so on a day where I'm not here, we find ourselves in, in a lot of areas that, uh, like last night in Roxbury, where you're really speaking to people for whom this is absolutely current events. It's the news of the day, just interpreted writ large at night. So. I agree with that. I want to thank Eugene for making this film first. I think it's very important. Um, <laughs> And if he hasn't already said it, uh, the film is widely available and people need to watch the whole hour and 48 minutes of it to get oh, a I real sense that. of that. It's very important. I'm uh, good at plugging the And film. he does a great job of editing it, as you can see as well. You didn't edit me out this version, did you? Uh, no, we didn't oh, edit okay. you out. Oh, okay. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but he came to see me how many years ago? Uh, three. Three years About ago. Three. And, yep. we, and, and uh, <clears throat> a, a fair amount of the conversation is in the film. Uh, Are you trying to say that I don't make my movies quickly? No, I think you took your time. Okay. <laughs> so you're trying to say that I don't like it. Right. right. Yeah. And I also want to say, you maybe already introduced Marion Wright Edelman, but I, she should be on our team too, because uh, the founder of the Children's Defense Fund and a civil rights lawyer, someone who's been doing uh, the important work, we have to reach children. I, I think you can see from this film how important <clears throat> it is to stop young people from being exposed to it. And I hope we have a lot of troops here, uh, troops on the ground who will help us uh, to do the work we need to do. Uh, and I'm glad that this room is packed. It just reinforces the, the, the students' interest in this, but we need you to help us get the word out uh, at every uh, conceivable uh, level. Uh, this is a wonderful event, uh, co-sponsored by the Kennedy School and the Law School. Uh, but there are students at the college, students who are not connected with Harvard, students who are all over this community who are influenced by it, and people who are looking for jobs, uh, people who are looking for homes, uh, people who have all sorts of uh, challenges that uh, are uh, subliminally addressed in this film but makes a big part of, uh, of what we're trying to do with this. Uh, and we have uh, created a partnership. Um, I think I spoke out of tune last night by telling people, we'll go anywhere. And it's not even for food it's or money, fun. right? But we we'll will. But the it. whole idea is how important this message is to make people understand what has happened uh, in the last uh, few decades. Uh, and at some point, and, and Gene spoke in my class today, uh, the students were very uh, enthralled and interested, and some of them are here tonight. And I think it just reinforces the fact uh, that 
although we've heard the topic, the war on drugs, the mass incarceration, I think what we see now uh, is the fact that it's affecting every community. And he'll talk about, you know, it's, it's not a black issue, even though you see a lot of African Americans in the film. Every community <clears throat> has poor people. Every community has homeless people. Every community has people looking for jobs. Uh, and, and every community has young people who need some direction. Uh, and we're hoping that uh, this will be the beginning of an important mission on our part to get people to address these issues that are so important to what's going on in our communities. I want to echo that and, and add maybe two uh, reflections from my side, one about the children's aspect and the other about the sort of democratization of the drug war outside the black community. <clears throat> First of all, in deference to black folks in this country who remain the absolutely primary target of the criminal justice system, let it be said, we're a far cry from a democratized drug war. Right. What you see is still that black people are the center of the action, but to put it in crass business terms, which is appropriate because it's a business, the largest growth trending areas are among poor whites, Latinos, and women. Now that's an interesting note because as you hear more and more, if you think about the last news item you heard about drugs, it's usually about sort of pharmaceuticals and over-the-counter stuff, or bath salts, or marijuana of an, of an enhanced nature. It's not classically the rhetoric we associate with the special stigmatization of the black population with drugs. You don't hear a lot about crack right now, for example. I don't know if it's in this cut, because this cut is shortened and I can never remember what's in it, but does this cut deal with the fact that black people were never the majority population of crack users? So that was an astonishing discovery. It was such a discovery for me that at a late hour, I almost called the movie Crack is a White Drug. Because I thought, what better way to jar the system and remind you of the lies we tell ourselves than to realize that my whole life, I've lived under a lie perpetrated by the drug war that made me think that drug was dominantly used by black people. So as we see it democratizing today, what's important to note about that is not that we should draw some illusory lesson that now, uh, black people are getting a, a, a reprieve. They're not. Richard Pryor once said uh, that the definition of an epidemic, he said, well, that's what they call it when it affects white people. Mm -hmm. And funny as that is, people have said to me as a corollary to that, do I think the drug war will now reform because poor whites are being targeted? As if to say, well, now that it's going white, is it going to be quicker to be reformed? And I would say, well, actually, I think that assumes naively that the power structure cares any more about poor white people than it does about poor black people. And I think it's demonstrating that it doesn't. The growth areas tell you that. So on one level, we have to recognize the growth of this into other areas, not to give ourselves false comfort or false conclusions, but to say, good, there's even more of an army for its reform. There are just that many more people who can be appealed to. Sadly, people don't seem to think well outside their own box. They need to hear that their own relative is imperiled or their own community is imperiled. It's almost a tragic part of the human species. But let's work it, because whether it's something we like or not, it means that there is now greater strength in numbers at a moment where potential reform is there. What I wanted to say about children, and I say this with Ms. Edelman present, is that we had a very interesting experience recently where I was going to show the film, we've shown the film at several schools, and we found ourselves in Washington, D.C. at Ballou High School, which is one of the poorest high schools in D.C., with a community of students there, a lot of whom like are in between housing. They've seen murders in their lives. They have incredible obstacles up against them. And I come in there with my movie, and me and Danny Glover, because Danny's one of the executive producers of the film, a long-distance runner, runner for justice as well, who always shows up, just like Professor Ogletree does, to help me get the word out with the movie. So Danny comes down to Washington. We sit down in front of this body of students. And it dawns on me as we're about to start talking that my movie's relatively agnostic about drug use. I do all the necessary tipping of the, you know, dotting the I and crossing the T that drugs are overtly bad for human beings and damage them, and drugs have ravaged communities, and what the drugs haven't done, the war on drugs has simply made worse. So I do that, and I recognize that as a public health concern of deep gravity for me. But for students in front of me, many of whom have drug use all around them and have the potential of becoming involved in drug use and sale all around them, I felt, well, I wonder if my movie's insufficiently responsible to this. I wonder if it doesn't go far enough in its, in its language and in its presentation. And so I sat down with the students wondering what they were going to get out of it and whether it's at all confusing that here's a guy when they most need to fear the drugs and the drug culture around them, because that's their most immediate threat before they even get to law enforcement. Should I be fighting that battle more, more, more sternly? 
And I noticed that, first of all, they got the message loud and clear that drugs are bad, but the drug war is worse. I didn't need to state it any louder than I had. It was very clearly in their, in their perception of the film. But I was set up in a very interesting way to be able to say something that I thought was really positive. And, 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 and in fact, the grave tragedy of the movie and the injustice that's represented in the movie armed me enormously to say one very specific thing to the young people who were in the room, which was, whatever anyone's going to tell you about whether you should or shouldn't play with drugs in your life, and I can clearly tell you that having seen people whose lives have been so touched by these drugs, not one of them cherishes the day they ran into the drugs. They all rue the day that they came in contact with the drug that opened the gateway to this slippery slope into hell for them. Whatever people are going to tell you about that, I'll tell you one thing which is what this movie represents is the incredible set of horrors and industrial inhumanities that you open yourself up to through drug use. You open yourself up to, to no longer being captain of your own destiny. And I look at a lot of you in this room today with the way you dress and the way you got bling on and the way you hope to get over in the next chapter of your life and be the man or the woman that people look up to and that people answer to. You are on a track very far from that when you enslave yourself by first enslaving your mind to a substance and then enslaving yourself to those who mean to exploit that vulnerability. And that message for these kids, I felt weirdly like Nancy Reagan because I was kind of doing a just say no routine, but it was an actual just say no routine to just say no to becoming enslaved by a third party in any way in your life at all. And they were looking at Danny Glover, master of his own destiny, me, to some degree, I look like a master of my own destiny. And I could see us becoming masters of your own destiny role models through the gravity portrayed in the movie. And that's something we hope to continue at a childhood level. We're going to go to questions in a couple of minutes. Um, and there are microphones here, there. There's some upstairs too, right? Nothing's changed. So if you want to get uh, in front of a microphone, we're going to be going to uh, questions. And in my experience of decades of uh, teaching, uh, the, the really brilliant question uh, includes no more than eight words. So it gives you a chance <laughs> to work on it, refine it, and have a really captivating statement that you have to make. Uh, but we'll take some questions from It's also, we feed these images out to other schools around the country, so it is really important that the questions be short so you get to cover that much ground. Because we always, with these events, make sure that it's not just what's going on in the room. Like when we were at Shiloh Baptist Church in D.C., we had 225 churches to whom the signal was also going out right. so that that many more people can have the benefit of the same experience. So keep the questions tight. Question uh, here to the right. Hi, my name is Jack Cole. I'm a retired New Jersey State Trooper, uh, 26 years, 14 years undercover in narcotics. I now run a founding member of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Over 100,000 police judges, prosecutors, who all believe that uh, the only way to answer all these things that you've pointed out so correctly is to legalize and regulate these drugs to take them out of the hands of the criminals and end the violence. We have over 160 speakers. We've given over 10,000 presentations the last 10 years. And we convince about 80% of our audience, no matter where we go. We would like to help you on this. I would love to talk to you after this is John, over about great. it, if I may. We have, I have a lot of respect for LEAP. And I don't know if people know about LEAP, but you should Google them. It's kind of like your dream organization of guys who are on the inside, whether judges, cops, or whatever, who finally come to speak out and say, what we were doing was wrong, what we were doing did not work. Uh, it takes a huge amount of courage for people who everybody knows are crossing that kind of line of blue or wall of blue or whatever to do that kind of thing. And so, yeah, I mean, we've had, you know, um, Neil Franklin and others have been real allies of ours, and I care a lot about the organization, so. Yeah, Neil spoke in my class last year yeah. about this and uh, spends time here and uh, around the country. And I, I think what LEAP is doing is, Reno uh, innovative in terms of law enforcement talking about some of those issues as well. In fact, if you look at the film, I was, I was going to say there are a lot of people who are law enforcement uh, who are in the criminal justice system are saying, you know what, we've been in this for decades and we've, we've lost the war. We're not winning the war at all. We need to do something different. And now they're talking about health care and talking about treatment as opposed to punishment. And I think that's a remarkable benefit of this film to make people think about the alternative. One thing I think is particularly uh, has become clear to me over time is that LEAP was a well-chosen acronym because of the inclusion of the word prohibition in it. Because one of the strongest arguments 
you can make in a world where reasonable people will debate these things. I don't mean arguments with crazy people, we're having too much of those, but the ones with reasonable people who actually can, can move the world forward, is that what we are doing is as if we got hit on the head and forgot prohibition and the disaster that right. prohibition produced. We learned from the prohibition of alcohol that it didn't work, it created more trouble than it solved, and so we quickly scrambled to come up with something else, and what we came up with was a system of taxing and regulating a substance. And tax and regulate, interestingly enough, is what the British call legalization. I don't use the word legalization, because most Americans run for the hills when you talk about legalization, because they figure it's going to be dawn of the living dead the next day, with like cats and dogs living together and your kid you know, getting dealt drugs to at the playground. So I don't use the word legalization, also because I think it's slightly wrong-headed. I think what we did with alcohol has government playing the right public health role. Now, I think we insufficiently do it even with alcohol. In other words, I would like to see a more robust treatment system for America's extraordinary levels of addiction to alcohol. But how can anyone argue for the system we currently have in place where illegal drugs in this country, not one of which has the track record of damage to public health or public safety that alcohol has, that all of them are dealt with more severely than alcohol. How can you possibly explain that? Except that there is a massive set of industrial interests and bureaucratic thrusts who profit off of this ongoing insanity. And so it would seem to me that the easiest thing to get Americans to buy into came from an audience member in Santa Fe, New Mexico a month or two ago. I went there with the marshal from New Mexico, who we have in the long form film. I don't know if he's in this film. He's got a 10 gallon hat and he monitors the border. And I went with him to a screening in Santa Fe. And he's a real lawman. And a man in the audience stood up and he said, Marshall, I get the feeling you and I vote the same way. And everybody knew what that meant. He said, but I have a question for you. He said, why did we take an industry, the illegal drug industry, worth tens of billions of dollars a year, and give over complete monopolistic control of it to thugs and cartels. Right. Mm -hmm. And I watched the Marshall Processes, who is a lawman and a hardcore devotee of the war on drugs in certain parts of his nature. And he looked at the guy and he goes, <coughs> I'm going to have to get back to you on that. <laughs> and I think that's a vulnerability in the line of argument that you guys calling yourself law, against, law enforcement against prohibition puts you in a very, very strong position to make prohibition and the way it shames us in the present, the issue. Sure, and all we're talking about is, uh, when, when we talk about it, is end the war on drugs, treat drug abuse as a health problem instead yeah. of a crime problem. That's we don't want to see one more drug abuser in the entire world. We spent our entire careers working against that. <laughs> we haven't changed our mind. All we've changed our mind about is what will work. Yeah. Thank you Great. very much Thank for waiting. Question here, then we're going to go up to the uh, uh, microphone on the left and microphone on the right. Okay. Yep. Hi, my name is Ben Bolger, and it, and it strikes me that the recidivism rate in prisons is an extraordinarily indicting statistic. And if that failure rate were the same for the airline industry, I don't think anyone would fly on a plane. Uh, so I what, I, is, what, what I'm curious about is how is it that we as a country tolerate the recidivism rates that we have, and what do you think will take it to change the paradigm from focusing on retribution to focusing more on rehabilitation and helping people more productively adapt to positively contributing to the communities I, when they're I think released. it's very simple. Uh, people in a lot of our communities see the problem is them, not us. And that defines everything that they do, everything that they think about it. And they think they pay more because they live in gated communities. Uh, they, they are in uh, suburban America. They are away from, they're in private schools. They think they're avoided, but their children are using drugs just as much as anybody else in, in their urban communities. And I think that's what we need to make clear, that it's, it's, it's real. But I, I and I, I like think even more than that, I th that, the problem is that treatment is not our number one goal. It has to be, because right now it's still punishment. It doesn't matter who, and I don't know if you talk about this, but no matter who's in the White House or who's in power, Treatment is not the primary responsibility. One of the people who lectured here decades ago is Deborah Prothero Stith, who wrote a book about dangerous consequences. And everybody said, what's she talking about? Treatment, about you know, rehabilitation. That's what it's about. And no one's going to have a campaign, I don't think, a successful campaign, I'm running for X because I'm going to treat drug users, drug offenders. It, it, and we have to start that dialogue here, that they are people too. 
And it's not us against them, it's all of us. And I think that's part of the problem of recidivism. And you think about it, the reason people fail, it's not, people have failed recidivism because they didn't make a meeting at the probation office. They failed because they didn't get a job. They failed because they uh, didn't go to a particular place. And it's hard to explain that here, but if you go to a place in Roxbury and if you walk three blocks, you're walking through two or three gangs. So you didn't go to that place. You can't tell anybody, I can't go through that because I might get shot or beaten or something else. And we live in a, in a world that ignores that. So I, I think that right now a lot of people are put back in prison or in jails because of recidivism saying that they failed something. And just go to court once. I'm, I'm sure you've been. But go to court once and listen to the 27 conditions that you're released upon in order to go home. You have to do these 27 things. And, and no human person can do all of them. And, and I, I think the, the, the idea, if I were in that situation, I'd say, excuse me, could you repeat once again, what are the 27 things I'm supposed to do by tomorrow? And it becomes absurd because it can't be done humanly. You can't look for a job. You can't stay at home. You can't report to your probation officer. Uh, you can't, uh, you know, do this X, Y, and so you just can't do it. But you say, do I want to be released? Do I want to stay in jail? And so you sign the, the proclamation that you'll do it when, in, when we know it's a failure the way that it's designed. So rehabilitation is one of the things that should be addressed and not recidivism. It's a major problem that needs to be taken out of the system because it just doesn't work. I mean, I, yep. I, I would say one more thing about this from the, um, whereas Professor Ogletree is talking about it from the street level, I'll tell you what I learned within the prison system itself, which is corrections official after corrections official told me in many ways the same bitterly ironic tale, which is, they would say, look, after your first couple of years of being a hot-blooded young prison guard, you kind of get used to the fact that you're dealing with human frailty in here. People come in here, and if you're going to do your job at all well, where you could represent it to your kid at all, you're trying to get these people to the next place in life where they get out of here with something more than they came in. Because you learn very quickly that almost none of them ever had a job. Almost none of them were ever given character skills. Very few of them had a full household giving them, you know, giving them guidance. They come from shattered communities. So if I can give them a faith and character program, or I can teach them air conditioning repair, or plumbing and heating, or carpentry, I'm giving them something they could get out of here in a, and reduce recidivism with. And I feel good about that. And then lo and behold, a politician crops up who wants to score points on sounding tough on crime. So he promises more handcuffs, more cops on the beat, more overtime, etc. Flooding me with more bodies because the levels of arrest go up. But of course, they got to pay for those policies somehow. So where do they get the money? They take the money out of the very budgets I would need to provide programs to those new people. So now they give me more people and strip away all that I could do with them until I'm down to the fact that they've stripped away so much that all I have left is the money I need to build more beds with. He said, so at the end of the day, of course we start warehousing people and the recidivism rates continue to rise and I watch the same people come through here. And if I'd only heard it from one prison official, it would be a deep analysis. By the time I heard it from 20 prison workers, it becomes second nature to them to understand that this is the problem. But that same concentration of interests, because why do we want more people in the beds? We want more people in the beds because there's bureaucratic thrust of jobs from the lowest level all the way up to the highest profiteers within those 400 rich, richest Americans who are benefiting from those bodies in the beds. So the politicians are writing laws because they're on the payroll to write those laws. They're writing laws that fill those beds, making things that weren't crimes into crimes and making sure they're in for longer and longer sentences. So there's a vested interest in recidivism. So in order to go up against that vested interest in recidivism, Recidivism is profitable for political reasons and economic reasons. You'd have to have an incredible force to break through that and shed light on the tragedy of it. And after all, who are you advocating for? People it's very hard to represent because they only come across as convicted felons. And so incredibly hard to break through that cloud of hyperbole that keeps business as usual. I'm going to take the next question here. Just for the audience, uh, whenever you uh, check, check uh, your home, your city, your state, and see the balance between uh, the state's commitment to education, the state's commitment to public sa safety. That tells you a lot about what the priorities are. Now, how do you make that budget at the beginning? That is, you start off in January with a budget that says 70% is on public safety and 30% uh, or less is on education. That tells you something about the priorities. And until those change, we're in trouble. Question, comment? 
Thank you very much for uh, your comments on the screening tonight. Uh, I'm Josh Barthel, and I'm a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee here uh, at Harvard. I'm asking this question on behalf of the committee. Uh, most of the discussion tonight has focused on more traditional uh, illegal substances. I'm wondering what your thoughts are uh, or policy recommendations regarding uh, illicit prescription drug abuse. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, at the end of the day, for a guy with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So when I started to hear about the rise in uh, the sudden new focus on new chemicals, I was at the Apollo Theater in New York on the night that the movie came out, and um, Carl Hart, who's a professor at Columbia of uh, neuroscience and of uh, especially in the experimentation of how drugs affect the brain, he was there and he said to the audience, he said, everybody is here has heard about this guy who ate the other guy's face in Florida, and everybody had heard about it. And he said, did you all hear what the drug was? And a chorus of voices from the audience, Apollo size, shouted out, bath salts. And Carl Hart looked at all these people and said, it wasn't bath salts. And they all looked at him like he was nuts, because they'd all heard on the TV that it was bath salts. And I looked at him like, I'm with crazy person over here. Doesn't, doesn't he read the press? It's all bath salts. And I said to him afterward, Carl, what's up with the bath salts thing? And he said, I administer bath salts at Columbia. I administer all kinds of drugs to people. That's not what bath salts do. I've done an enormous amount of work in bath salts. That's not what they do. And I thought, wow, this is a confident guy. Two weeks later, it came out, it wasn't bath salts. And I thought, wow, I want to be that confident one day. Mm -hmm. But what he had an eye to was the next hysteria around any corner in this country in the way that we create propaganda about drugs. Am I going to tell you that there isn't rampant abuse of pharmaceuticals? Of course there is. I live in Vermont. We're covered in it. So the question becomes not what is the impact of those drugs and how do we deal with that as a public health matter because that's not where our focus is going to be. I would like to see that dealt with as a massive public health matter. And in many ways it would begin to indict the pharmaceutical industry that's creating those drugs. We would begin to notice, for example, that in the several violent outbreaks that we've had in the past year of extraordinary tragedy in places like Newtown, that all too often you find that the people involved are deeply involved with over-the-counter pharmaceuticals and conventional pharmaceuticals. That's a story no one wants to talk about, but that's a public health crisis that goes to our lack of a mental health system in America, our lack of basic treatment services in America, our lack of treatment services with government power behind them, and so we have a treatment system that doesn't work. So I would love to see those talked about for their actual impact on, human, on the human psyche and on public safety and public health, but of course the discourse will be trapped in the vilification of them for the expansion of law enforcement activities in the new dispatch community. And of course, we're off to the races at that point. So it's hard for me to filter on out with the other, but I want to think about them as a public health matter and understand what they tell us about our massively over-addicted society per se. There was an old thing in New York City when I was growing up. If a homeless person would come and ask you for money, you've all heard this in one way or another, somebody will give the person a dollar and say, don't spend it on alcohol. And my mom did this once when I was like a teenager. And I remember thinking, there was something I didn't like about it. I think what I didn't like about it at the time was just the sort of paternalistic, who told you you could tell a guy what to do? I mean, give him the dollar. He didn't ask for a morality lesson, just give him the dollar. But it goes further than that now where I realize, for anybody who thinks that way, how many people in this audience are themselves or know someone who's on something like Prozac? I mean, let's do a show of hands. Okay? So you're telling me the rest of you don't know somebody who's on a drug like Prozac? And I go, please. <laughs> They're not so going to admit it. If, I mean, it's not so shameful, but it's called the American way. More people use Prozac than I eat Wheaties at this point. So if you're dealing in a nation that has so much interaction with pharmaceuticals, then why is that guy the only guy who's not allowed to self-medicate? Why is his bottle of Chivas Regal off limits, but Prozac's okay for your friend who's feeling the need to self-medicate. And so I think we've gotten to a point for a national conversation about this addicted nation and why the pain. Question here. Thank you for your time. My name is Sarah Estel, and I'm an MPP2 and very proud classmate of Brandon Moores here at the Kennedy School. Um, there are a lot of contributing factors to the issue, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up three. But Michelle Alexander and others have mentioned the black boxes that have been upheld by the Supreme Court concerning 
police discretion, concerning prosecutorial discretion, and concerning the penalties for drug felony charges upon release from prison. And I was wondering with all of the stories that you two have collected, what do you see as the most critical point for action, just of those three? You know, it's very interesting. The, the thing that troubles me about the criminal justice system is mandatory minimums. Uh, people are in jail serving enormous amount of times. It's, it's brought out in the film. Uh, and I think that is something that we could do something about. The, the whole idea of reducing the penalty uh, for crack versus powder cocaine from 100 to 1 to 18 to 1, that's progress, but it's still discriminatory. It's still a law that punishes people because of what they use, and I think that that's not a good sense. But getting rid of mandatory minimums would be my top priority, and I hope some person in politics will say that, or somebody in this audience will run, because uh, they've got my vote, uh, to talk about how to fix the system and talk about treatment uh, and health care as opposed to punishment and putting people in jail forever. Eugene? The last guy who had your vote won. So. <laughs> Everyone who had my vote won. Yeah, so if anybody says, oh, what does his vote matter, you know. Um, yeah, I agree. I second the problem of mandatory minimums. I think one of the things to note about Michelle's argument about prosecutorial power is you'll notice that in this cut and even in the longer cut of the film, which I urge everyone to go download, but don't download it because you're looking for a villain because I don't have a villain. And somebody said to me, there's no villain in your movie. And by the way, there's no prosecutors in your movie. Those are related because if you put a prosecutor in a movie like mine, they will come across as the villain because the prosecutorial power in the courtrooms of America is a villainous phenomenon. The prosecutors themselves don't have to be villainous for that to be the case because the villainy of prosecutorial excess in America is a consequence of Congress having written laws that ties the hands of judges and overempowers prosecutors. If I was a prosecutor to do my job well, I have to actualize those laws that Congress wrote to the excessive power of prosecution. So the interesting thing there just to note is there's a constitutional debate to be had about here you have Congress for its own reasons of wanting to get money out of the industries and wanting to bring jobs to the district and keep people in the beds writing ever more excessive mandatory minimum sentences that disempower judges and overempower prosecutors. So now you have the legislative branch empowering the prosecutor, who is after all from the executive branch. So now you have the legislative branch empowering the executive branch at the expense collectively of the judicial branch. So now you have judges having their hands tied by that joint venture, which is an extraordinary undermining of the balance of power, the separation of power between the branches to say nothing of its results in man's inhumanity to man and judges in this country literally turning to Prozac to deal with the incredible pain they feel over watching injustice on their watch. Um, like Judge Bennett in our film and like Judge Billy Wilkins who was Reagan's appointee who created the Sentencing Commission, when I went to him thinking finally I'll have a villain because he's the one who set up this system, he said, I don't agree with the system we set up. And I thought, where can I find a villain here? Thank you. Yep. Hello. Uh, this is really great. Um, my name is Julia Evans, and I'm from Tufts University, and I'm a student at the, for the program of narrative and documentary practice, as well as a student of philosophy. So I have one a production a question about, given that it's such a broad topic that is the drug war, how did you choose your subjects, and, and why, why did you choose one, one uh, victim of the drug war versus another. And then a theoretical question about general deterrence, and this is for you, Professor, in, insofar as like a theory of justice, you have general deterrence. And my understanding is general deterrence is uh, well, well intended, but it, it's not intended, the, the intentions are not apt unless you have like a corrective justice, as you were saying before. And I was like, I would like to hear your comments as that, as well as um, while you were producing this film and interacting with the justice system, how much do you see the corrective justice as uh, working and, uh, and what was your experience with that? Okay, should I answer my, my side of first? Um, from a documentary perspective, you know, I'd love to give you a really smart answer that I've got a real technique for how I come upon who to interview or whose stories to feature. Um, I would say, you know, Louis Pasteur said that luck favors the prepared mind. 
The one thing I make sure in myself and my team is that we're a deeply prepared set of minds. We all come to live, eat, breathe uh, materials surrounding the issue at hand, whether it's the military industrial issues I've studied or other studies or, or the prison industrial problem and the drug war problem. Um, everybody becomes so sensitized to it that everything that comes across our transom suddenly seems movie worthy. And then there comes a bunch of Another adage is Woody Allen's idea that 99% of life is just showing up. And so I would say that there's a, a luck of the draw that happens. I wish I could say that it's all by design, but like I meet different people in a movie like this in different ways. Federal Judge Bennett, who speaks in such an outspoken way as a judge in the film, he walked into the restaurant owned by one of the producers of the film's father to have lunch. And he got to chatting with him over soup. And the guy said, yeah, I'm a federal judge. And the producer's father said, my daughter's making a movie about the drug war. You got any stuff going on with the drug war? And the judge said, that's all I do. Well, here's my daughter's card. Maybe you guys could get in touch. So that's how he ended up in the movie. That's the scientific, brilliant way that I tracked him down. Um, I knew exactly what kind of soup he likes, and I made sure we served it to him. Um, then, you know, the marshal in Magdalena, New Mexico, and I don't know if he's in this cut, but he's, in, he's a big part of the, the main movie. I stopped the marshal to ask for directions on a drive I had across New Mexico, got to talking and asked him whether I could ever take a ride in his patrol car to learn more about the drug war, and five minutes later I was driving around in his patrol car, not in the back seat. Um, and yet then there are people like Charles Ogletree or Michelle Alexander where you can't make the movie without them because they're definitive voices on the subject and you've got to make sure they're there because if you're me, you're trying to close off all roads to Rome. Like my job in a movie, whether it's a good idea or bad, I don't know, but it's how my career has been defined, is I'm always seeking to make the movie where I can look back and think, I left no stone unturned. My staff keeps wanting us to rename our production company, No Stone Unturned, because I try everything I can think of to try to get an argument across, but I also make sure that I don't want anyone later on to go, you know what, it was a good film, but that's just how it is in Baltimore or that's just how it is in Boston. If he were to have gone to Michigan, he'd get a whole, I want to cover the country. So we were in 25 states, and that means not only do I want 25 states worth of all levels of the drug war, but I also want the key luminaries to put that in context, political, socioeconomic, and historical. And so we reached out to Professor Ogletree and others, Michelle and others, for that reason. Let me just say a word about that. If you really watch this film closely, there's a lot of time spent on Oklahoma the last place that people would think that there's yeah. a drug problem. And you see all these people in prison and it just opens up. This is not a Compton, South Central Los Angeles, Detroit, Chicago, Newark problem. It's a global problem. Right. It happens everywhere. And I think that, that helps it. In terms of uh, uh, deterrence, and general deterrence as opposed to uh, specific deterrence, uh, there are a lot of theories. And I, I, I use all those when I talk, talk about criminal law and criminal procedure. Uh, and the one that people seem to reject is one of those theories is rehabilitation. Because, ah, you know, that was done in the 60s and 70s. It's done. And there's this mentality that the whole idea of helping, treating, uh, aiding people is lost in our system of criminal uh, jurisprudence. And I'd like to see us change that. And I'd like to spend more time talking about rehabilitation. That's what we were modeled on as opposed to all the other theories of punishment that are pretty severe as opposed to the theories of treatment uh, which are underrepresented and understated. That needs to be the next step. I want to add one thing to that which goes to the documentary ethics issue. So then I'm out there and I'm kind of willing to take all comers and I meet with a lot of people and I follow a lot of story leads, some of which don't pan out, some do. To give you an example, along the way I'm the child of people who fled Nazi Germany. I'm looking at the drug war with a full sensitivity to the outflow of history. I'm worried about persecution in any society. I'm worried about to any degree we're doing it here. And I read a news story about a judge, I think in either, maybe it was in Washington State, who had two African-American uh, accused in front of him that he was supposed to sentence. And uh, he did sentence them to prison. Uh, he noticed in his interaction with them that uh, both of them had gold teeth, and he remanded that on their way to the incarceration facility, they needed to be brought to a court-appointed dentist to have their teeth removed as property of the state. So you can imagine I wanted to cover that. And I send my staff into a flurry of research about that, because what a shocking expression of so many things gone awry in the drug war as that. 
We go and find out that actually a smart defense lawyer intervened and said that might be a little too much, like Nazi Germany maybe, and, 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 and so it didn't happen. And so I end up thinking, well, if I go down that road and I pursue that it didn't happen, I'm really just there for the sensationalism of the event. My movie's probably not going to be driven well by sensationalism, so that one ended up on the ash heap of our research. But it also goes to the question of remaining open to developments, because views that you have up front about the potential wrongdoing in a situation, you want to have them, but you don't want to become so rigid about them. We have this flip-flopping thing in American life right now where you're supposed to always be able to prove that you never change your views. I'm not sure where this value came from. John Maynard Keynes famously was accused of changing his views. He, I, I give this to you because it's the best ammunition ever to use against someone who accuses you of changing your views. He said, well, sir, when I get new information, I change my views. What, sir, do you do with new information? And I've always been terribly moved by this because I go about the whole movie process hoping that I'm going to change my views and that they'll become more educated. And one of the things that happened is movie characters that you come into contact with who are expert because they're on the front lines, very often they give you things you could never even have dreamt of that even deepen your critique of the system. There's an inmate in Oklahoma who, like many, told me coming to prison was good for me. He said to me in the middle of the interview, this is probably the best thing that ever happened to me in my life. Now the camera's rolling and I'm trying to make a movie about how bad the prison system is. So I feel like saying, cut, you know, <laughs> not included here. But instead I realize, well, wait, let the camera roll. Let's go further down this. And then you remember that Dostoevsky teaches us that you can judge any society by the quality of its prison. Well, what does it tell you when an inmate is telling you that the world outside is so forsaken, so war-torn and so ravaged that the first time he got four walls of bed and some time for contemplation was coming to jail? That that's the best thing that ever happened to him? How bad has your society become? The commentary becomes much deeper than the original one I had of look how bad prisons are. So very often you have to be very open to the deeper development of the ideas, even if they might challenge you and make it harder to have the convenient standpoint you had to begin with, your film will be richer. Let me just say this, we're about to run out of time. I, I don't want the, uh, the Crimson or any of the newspapers to report that we said that jail is great for people. <laughs> right, <laughs> that's a Until misnomer. Until further notice, American society is such that it's making jail look positive. That's exactly is that right. Okay? We are out of time, but can we take the two questions Let's here and two it. questions there because we, we have Let's to end. Let's Just have the questions and then we answer, try to answer we'll try all to of them collectively. Answer them. Okay, great. <laughs> thanks for your time and thanks for presenting this film. Um, it raises a lot of very interesting questions and mine relates to the parallel you drew between the war on drugs and, and genocide specifically in Germany. Now, there was one step which maybe is included in the longer, in the longer cut of this film, but after, after all the steps that you described, in, in many cases, or there's always a question of reparations which may or may not be addressed as it, as it was not in the Soviet Union after the disbanding of the Communist Party, but the, what, the, what there was in Germany uh, at the Nuremberg trial, and it, and it includes, includes both financial reparations and um, emotional steps like the Truth and Reconciliation Committee in South, South Africa, Africa because you're yeah. really, you're, you, you are ratifying the fact that an enormous injustice has been committed to a large number of people whose sentences might time, be abridged. You're saying let's so, put reparations on the table. Yeah. I got well, it. no. What's your recommendation? Okay. How do you prevent social unrest? Gotcha. Gotcha. Next question here. Thank you again. Um, in New York City, there are approximately 50,000 marijuana arrests every single year, and you've mentioned treatment a number of times. Do you think treatment? is a viable alternative or solution for those people who've been arrested? And have you researched drug treatment programs for the poor? And do you know the number of people who use illicit drugs who are actually addicts? Okay, okay. Uh, the top two questions, Jeff. Final two questions. Oh, thank you both for hosting this discussion. Um, a little look closer to the microphone. Uh, my name is Rodriguez Roberts. I'm a sophomore at the college. Uh, myself and a few of my friends actually read Michelle Alexander's New Jim Crow over um, winter break, and we're just wondering how would you, I guess, go about starting dialogue or discourse um, concerning this issue on the, on campus? Should we be uh, directing our, our fight towards, uh, I guess, race-neutral progress, or should we uh, just be focused on general education? Just what are your thoughts on, I guess, um, activism? Okay. Hello, my name is Top Agabalagoon, and I'm also a sophomore at the college on the Harvard Black Men's Forum. 
And um, I have two questions, one directed to Professor Ogletree and one um, to um, Mr. Eugene. Um, foremost um, for, um, to Professor Ogletree, uh, my question is um, in a constitutional sense when you look at pretext stops and you look at, um, uh, you look at um, ideas of presentation of bias in the justice system through Warren v. United, McClensey v. Kemp, and um, disenfranchisement that sounds a lot like a poll tax when you have to go through all these hoops to go and get your right to vote back. Um, is the constitutionality of any of these presidents going to be revisited or do you think um, this new focus on, um, the mass, on the prison industrial complex is gonna um, reignite these kind of um, legal debates? And then my other question for Eugene is, I, there seems to be a lot of focus on economic policies or rationalizations of trying to go and present the prison industrial complex as money's being floated into these entities that are inimical towards our society. Um, I feel like at times this may put the focus away from the humanity of the prisoners and the humanity of people that have been incarcerated. Do you feel like there's a danger in pushing policies that may seem to be rational, but framing them in that sense instead of a more, um, I would say, um, hum humanitarian framework? Those are my two questions. Well, if we don't cover all of it in the people's answer, in our answers to these questions, I'm here afterward and Professor Ogletree is also so for one-on-one. -on -one. I would say in answer to the question about reparations, I'd love to get to the point where we concede the incredible inhumanity to man that we've conducted here for four decades, where we could even get to the concept of reparations. But for the moment, uh, it would be enough for me to repair simply what is an ongoing unraveling of our sense of decency. Um, and so I'd love to get to that point. Um, and I think that truth and reconciliation ought not come after the fact. Truth and reconciliation, it would seem to me, would be the way we'd have to go forward. We would have to admit that it was simply an accident of history that we got down the wrong path of dealing with something that's a health matter as if it's a criminal matter. It was only later that it became so profitable to the industries and the political corruption that now perpetuates it. But the accident of history was simply taking a wrong-headed view of addiction. We're a far more addicted country now where we know much more about how much addiction is in every part of this quick fix nation. And so we need to be very honest about that and deal with why the pain, deal with what it is about the American story that has foundered in many ways for so many people where they feel the need to self-medicate and to fix those aspects of society would be a great national calling. You would lead the world as a leader among equals if you set the moral and psychic example of going after your own demons in that way. We would be the, the envy of most of the world for doing that. So I think there's a very admirable national conversation, just as there is when a friend tells you they've finally decided to go to therapy. And you think, wow, good for you. This nation is, I always think of it kind of like the fat Elvis, that once upon a time, you know, Elvis was good looking and beautiful and great songs and he had like black guys in his band and the world thought he was cool and loved him and so he got popular songs and got a little bit of money and a little bit of power and then that grew and then before long he's like living in Las Vegas in a hotel ordering room service and every other quick fix you can think of, alcohol, drugs, barbiturates and everything else and the colonel who took care of him or whoever was taking care of him had to at a certain point notice that he was becoming a tragic, bloated, explosion of himself, which is what we've become as a nation. So much about what was great about us has now become hollow and exaggerated and subject to all these quick fixes that represent the addictions with which we ease our, our wounds as a nation. And so Elvis had a choice. People said to him, I'm sure who loved him, you're not the Elvis I used to know. You're just a big bloated version of who you were. What are you going to do? And Elvis, you know, Elvis died that way. So I think for this country's own survival and for its progress as a leader among equals in the world, there's a very magical moment in dealing with truth and reconciliation, and that involves the treatment that just got mentioned. Portugal is something everybody should Google. Ten years ago, Portugal decriminalized drugs across the board so that they now made it legal to have drugs across the board for possession, and every single leading indicator in Portugal has been a raving success ever since then. Drug use rates have gone down, HIV rates have gone down, violence rates have gone down, the criminal justice workload has gone down. And with the huge savings that that represented in the state of Portugal, just a portion of that has been devoted to make the most robust treatment system in the world. A treatment system with teeth, not the kind of fledgling treatment system in this country, which is run by the best intentioned people without a government to support them and without an infrastructure that, that, that recognizes that government has a role in the public health side of this. So treatment is a part of that truth and reconciliation. Let me just say quickly as well, the comments on all of them, I've been a 
a fan of and an advocate of, of reparations for a very long time. Uh, and if you look at it closely, the whole idea is to have a discussion about repairing the damage that's been done and making things go forward. And I think that's something that can happen without the antagonism. When people think it's only money, uh, it, there's a lot more that, that's involved with reparations. And some of the other questions, I, I wanted to comment on the constitutional issue. And it's very interesting here looking at this. There is a concept that is 50 years old now that's been uh, supported by the court uh, uh, that's called stop and frisk, right? Uh, that's a, from a 1963 case uh, out of uh, Ohio, the Supreme Court decided. Uh, and what we're talking about now is not stop and frisk. It's stop on site without any probable cause, without any evidence. People are being stopped in New York. They've been stopped in California. They've been stopped here in Massachusetts because police have incredible powers now to do things that were never imagined before. In New York, let me give you an example. It may have been discussed before, but the whole idea is that there's a contrary view between what the people are doing in California and in New York. Marijuana should no longer be a criminal offense. It should not be a, a, a crime where you can get arrested. You can get a citation, you can pay you know, a, a small amount and walk away. But what the police are doing in New York and other places, they're going to somebody, going to a neighborhood, usually African American, in Brooklyn, for example, uh, and, they're, and they're saying two things. Well, uh, I can't, I'm not gonna ask you if you have drugs, but if you show me your drugs, uh, then that's different, I, I can't search you. And then somebody will pull out the drugs and there's more than the quantity of personal use. So he says, I have to arrest you now because you have just committed in my presence a felony of possession of drugs. And, and that to me is a game that shouldn't be played on the one hand when they say you can't do it, but in fact police are doing that. That's part of the problem. And in terms of the other issues that, that are raised, what do we do now? This is a, an incredible audience of people who have Twitter accounts, who have, have blogs, who talk all the time, somebody just needs to say, why don't we get together and have a meeting to talk about how do we stop this war on drugs? Uh, the, the whole amazing thing is that you've seen, uh, you've read Michelle uh, Alexander's book, and it's just, the, uh, the, the, just getting the, the, the tip of the iceberg in terms of the problems, and she's identified them very well. But it's not hearing another speaker, it's doing something. Uh, and you don't have to wait for somebody else to lead you. There's some people here that we were met with last night in, in, in Roxbury who are saying, let's get together, let's do some things that make an enormous amount of difference. So I believe in stop and frisk. I think the doctrine makes sense, but that's not what we're experiencing now. We're the incredible amount of power that we're deferring because we think it's a problem that we can solve. And, and people in New York, if you look at the data, now it's in the court, thank God, the prosecutor's reconsidering, wait a minute, are we prosecuting too many people for drug offenses? And, and people look at the police and the judge is saying, wait a minute, are you stopping people and searching people without a warrant, without probable cause, because they're black? The vast majority, as Gene said, are African American males who are stopped with no drugs, no crime, no weapon, no nothing, but they're stopped. And that's what our systems come to as well. You won't hear a, a thing said at all about the idea of treatment uh, or about health care on the State of the Union tonight. You'll hear middle class, You'll hear tax relief. You might hear something about fighting the, you know, uh, terrorism around the world. But what are we doing about the folks who don't have a job, who don't have a home, who don't have an opportunity? You won't hear it tonight at all, not from the president, not from the rebuttals from uh, people who speak for the Tea Party or the Republicans. You won't hear it. It's not on anybody's agenda. And my view is that we have to start it right here, right now, right among ourselves, that we're going to stop this incredible use uh, and abuse of power that has millions, literally millions of people in jail, millions of people are going to jail, and not at all a solution to the problem, which is health and health care and treatment, not more punishment. I would add only one thing, and I never want to add anything after he talks because I just love listening to him, but I would say the only thing I would add is on this notion of what you will and won't hear tonight, we'll probably hear about gun violence in some gently expressed way, we'll hear about this extraordinary problem that the country is facing. But what an amazing thing to hear about that and be able to do the math on the sort of macabre sister corollary that it is of the issue we're talking about tonight. 
because while cops and patrol cars all over this country are incentivized to doggedly pursue petty nonviolent crime among young people who do not represent a threat to public safety, we have completely turned a blind eye to actual threats to public safety, which would be greatly helped if we had a system in place that had mental health services and medical services and drug treatment services. When I spoke in Oklahoma to a prison ch security chief who you see in this footage tonight, who has far more that he contributes in the longer film, one of the things he said to me is, Eugene, he said, you should know that here in the state of Oklahoma, you can't get mental health or drug treatment services unless you're rich because people don't have insurance, they can't afford it. So the first time that a lot of people get that kind of service is when they come to his facility. And he said, and you should know that my staff is not trained in mental health or drug treatment services, and yet, and he looked at me very gravely and he said, you should know that my prison is the largest provider of mental health services in the state of Oklahoma. So when you come to that point as a country, stop asking yourself why you have violence radiating outward and creating such extraordinary heartache while you have distracted yourself for the short-term political gain of politicians and the long-term economic gain of a handful. You've distracted yourselves from a real security matter and trumped up a non-security matter into an, in, an inappropriate level of focus. And so tonight you won't hear about that, Sister Carlary, the real damage that our, that our, our misguided focus has, has brought upon us. Well, thank you all for coming. I appreciate you being here. Thank you, my friend. We've done it again.